Well, hello again, everybody. Um, just wanted to take a chance today to go over uh, probably one of the biggest uh, question marks when you're looking at the third exam, which is this cardiac cycle graph, which is the start of your uh, chapter 9, part 2 outline. So the video that I'm going to go over today is uh, going to be how you can go about logically breaking down the graph um, using a couple of uh, easy tips that I'll go over in a minute. And um, I think it'll really help you get prepared for the exam. Um, I know that when I was in the class, this graph was just pretty intimidating. So um, what I'm going to do is use some of the uh, documents that I posted on Blackboard under the SI folder um, and see if we can't make this a little more uh, easy to understand. All right. So what I'm going to be using to explain most of it is going to be this worksheet um, that's in your extra exam prep folder for exam three. It's just called the chapter nine cardiac cycle list. And what it does, if you'll notice, it gives you a couple of uh, golden rules that I call um, to understand the graph. But then what it also does is it's numbered one through 25. And all of these numbers correspond with the numbers that are on the graph itself. So um, this is something that you can review on your own um, after I'm done explaining it. And um, also see if you can, um, you know, without looking at it um, after you studied it for enough time, see if you can write in the steps yourself going along with these numbers. Okay? So um, before we begin, there's a couple of um, things that I've kind of picked up um, in my time explaining it that really makes it a little more easy to understand. Um, this isn't something that necess is necessarily in your notes, but um, I think it just makes the graph a whole lot easier to understand. Um, and so um, I've outlined that below, but I also just wanted to use a, uh, a little of the terminology that you'll see on the exam, just some background info. Uh, so starting off with systole. Systole is going to be uh, completely synonymous with contraction. So anytime we say that we're in ventricular systole, all we're saying is that that ventricle is contracting, and when that heart muscle contracts, it's going to be ejecting blood. All right. The other word you'll be seeing quite often is diastole, and diastole refers to the relaxation. So as a chamber, such as the atria, are in diastole, they're going to be receiving blood more times than not. Okay. So the atrium ventricles, to reiterate, they, they um, contract in unison with one another. So our right and left atria contract at relatively the same time. Right and left ventricle contract at relatively the same time. When you're looking at this graph, one important thing to point out is that it's just going to be focusing on um, certain aspects of the left side of the heart. Okay, So you'll notice this graph goes through a lot of different dimensions of the cardiac cycle. Um, so looking at, looking at the electrical activities picked up by the ECG, it's looking at different pressure changes um, within our aorta and our uh, left ventricles and left atria. It's going over volumes within that ventricles, and it's also going over heart sounds. So it's important just to note that we're only looking at the left side of the heart on this graph, but because the right and left side mimic themselves in that sort of way, um, it's fine for us to do for study purposes. All right? So... Um, I outline these four what I call golden rules to understanding this graph and dominating cardiac physi physiology. So I'm going to trademark that and get some royalties. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that probably the easiest way to go about it is to keep a couple of these things in mind. The first of which um, is that the electrical events always come before the mechanical events, meaning what you see on the ECG is going to come before the actual mechanical events of contraction. contraction. So, um, for example, the P wave, which is an electrical event, does not mean um, the atria is contracting. The atria are contracting right after the P wave. So if you're taking a look at the graph, so here's our P wave, you know, even though it's depolarizing that atria, it's not until that PR segment right after the P wave that the atria contract. Then I say, likewise, a T wave, which represents ventricular repolarization, does not represent ventricular relaxation. So repolarization is looking at an electrical event. Relaxation is looking for a mechanical event. And we say that the ventricles relax after the T wave. Okay? So P wave, atrial depolarization, contraction follows depolarization. 
And if we're looking at our ventricles in this, this time, T wave ventricular repolarization comes before ventricular relaxation. So I think a lot of times people get themselves into trouble in like a true or false type question where it says true or false, the uh, atria contract during the P wave. That's false. The atria contracts right after the P wave, which is a PR segment. So that's kind of the first rule. What I like to do, and I'll say this a couple of times, when I'm looking at this graph, I love to use the ECG as a reference point. Because if we just remember that the mechanical events, the contraction, comes right after the electrical event, we can use the P wave and the QRS complex and the T wave to kind of logically go through what's actually happening mechanically. Okay, so keep that in mind. The next thing is that pressure in chambers increase due to two reasons. It's due to either A, an increase in blood volume, or B, contraction of the chamber. Okay, so there's going to be times where we see that blood is flowing from, let's say, our left atrium into our left ventricle. Well, as that left ventricle is receiving that blood, it's expanding, and the pressure in that left ventricle is going up. Another thing we'll see is that as that ventricle is contracting, so in other words, right after that QRS segment, or QRS complex, rather, right after that QRS complex, the ventricle contracts, therefore, that pressure in the ventricle goes up. So those are the two reasons why pressure goes up. Likewise, pressure in a chamber is going to decrease due to a decrease in blood volume so right after we have that blood ejected when there's left bl less blood left in that chamber the pressure is going to go down also pressure goes down to the relaxation of the muscle itself so following repolarization all right so that's our second golden rule next one Valves open and blood flows from a high to low pressure. So one of the things you're going to have to do for this next exam is know, okay, when do our AV valves open? When do our semilunar valves close? And you're going to have to be able to describe it in terms of pressure changes or pressure differences in certain chambers. Okay? And lastly, our fourth golden rule is know your blood flow. So following rule number three, you'll see how the pressure in one chamber will increase after it receives blood from another chamber. Okay, so to go over our valves, because I know this is probably another area of confusion for some people, our valves, like I said, valves will open and blood will flow from a high to low pressure. So we're looking at two groups of valves. We're looking at our AV valves, our atrioventricular valves, which are found right here, our tricuspid, and then our mitral valve. So they separate our right atrium from our right ventricle, left atrium from our left ventricle. And we see that they're going to open when the pressure in the atria is greater than the ventricles. When that happens, AV valves open, blood moves into our ventricles. They're going to close when the pressure in the ventricles is greater than the atria. Okay, and we'll go over this in a second, but this is going to occur after the QRS complex where that atria is going to begin to relax after it's repolarized and after those ventricles start to um, contract. Okay, so the pressure in the ventricles is greater than the atria, the AV valves close. This is going to correspond with one of our heart sounds, um, which is our first heart sound, or that lub sound. And that's going to be caused by the closing of that valve, and as that blood is hitting that closed valve, it's going to make a sound. All right, next, looking at our semilunar valves. So um, whether that be our pulmonary semilunar valve or our aortic semilunar valve, like I said before, we're just focusing on the left side of the heart, so we're going to talk about it in terms of our aorta. And when it's going to open is when the pressure in our left ventricle is greater than the pressure in our aorta. So as that ventricle starts to contract, pressure builds. When it's greater than the aorta, it's going to open up that valve. Okay. When it closes is when the aortic pressure is greater than the ventricular pressure. So this is going to occur after the T wave. During the T wave, Ventricles are repolarized, so after that T wave, they begin to relax. 
as that ventricle relax, there's going to be a period of time when the pressure is greater in the aorta. So at that point, valves are going to close, and we're going to be left with a, a notch on the graph, which we call the dichrotic notch. So kind of some foundational points. I'll reiterate it again later on. Um, but these are some things to keep in mind when you're looking at the graph. Okay. So now that we have the rules in place, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start going through um, steps 1 through 25. And I find that when I'm explaining it, it's a little bit easier, like I said, to use that ECG as a reference point. So I might jump around a little bit between 1 and 25. So you can print off this worksheet. It's found on Blackboard. Um, and if you, it helps you to go through it in order, um, do whatever works best for you. Um, but in my next video, I'm going to be looking through the graph and hitting on all of these points.